Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. In a distant coastal town in beautiful North Carolina, a solo veterinary practitioner is making international impact for pets and the profession. That's my guest, Dr. Ernie Ward. Dr. Ward has a fascinating vet life story from musician, which actually got him through the challenges of vet school, to starring on a TV show with Jeff Corwin. He is an example of with the right spirit, there's no boundaries to what you can accomplish. Ernie Ward graduated from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine and has spent his career blending healthy lifestyles and medicine. He is the founder of the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention and is internationally known for improving veterinary medical standards. The Association for Pet Obesity Prevention recently published their 20. 20- 22 State of Obesity Report, which I'll link in the description. I'll also link some of the numerous books and publications he has authored, such as Chow Hounds, Why Our Dogs Are Getting Fatter. Dr. Ward is currently Chief Veterinary Officer for Vertical Vet in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Veterinary Medical Lead for Base Paws Veterinary by Zoetis. Dr. Ward is a media personality, speaker, and lecturer, and the host of a very popular weekly podcast called The Veterinary Viewfinder. When he is not with his family and pets and contemplating solutions for pet patients, pet parents, and the planet, he can be found doing endurance athletics, surfing, and paddling. So let's paddle on to our conversation. I I hope this will just be a fun conversation to get to know you a little bit. There's a lot to kind of look at. I was looking at a lot of your podcast episodes. So what I do when I get to interview a fellow podcaster is I will go and scroll down to your very first episode of your podcast. And I always hope that it is like an intro episode. So you'll talk a little bit about yourself, not for you, you go straight into business. So, (laughs) (laughs) but I did find some really fun episodes. Um, Like when you were, you did a Valentine's day episode early on when you brought on spouses and I thought that was really fun. So I did find some some really good ones that uh, were a little bit more personal. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, I, and there's a, a lot to you. You've got podcasting under your belt, so this should uh, not be a, um, a a foreign thing to do. But I'm really interested in because way before the veterinary starts to come in into your timeline, I see a lot about music. So I'm really curious how you got interested in music and you were in a band. I was listening to some of your songs. So how did that start? <laughs> Hey, Megan. And again, thanks. It's great being with you guys. And I appreciate the stalking. It's always nice to know that people are out there. Uh, You can't escape the digital timeline, I guess. Um, Yeah, you know, music has always been a part of my life. I I feel really fortunate. Uh, Even from a young child, my father shared his love for music, Uh, you know, listening to lots of records from the 50s and uh, really kind of turned me on to a deeper appreciation of of music. And and really, he was a rock guy, you know, uh, so it was later that I kind of got into, you know, R&B and even classical and, of course, uh, later punk and new wave. Uh, so it's always been there. And I've always been a bit of a, of a performer. So, you know, I was doing uh, 4-H speaking clubs when I was young. And uh, then when I got to middle school, joined the band playing uh, alto sax and um, uh, so, you know, I was always doing that. And then uh, I found writing in high school and I had a, uh, a, a English teacher who said, you know, you really have a nice voice. And I wound up doing some state level competitions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I kind of put music on the back burner because creatively, I think I was always desperate for an outlet, right? So it's, you know, whether it's public speaking or, or writing or music, you know, I'm always, I, I think it's really important to cultivate that side of yourself, that creative creativity is, is also what helps you problem solve in, in life, whether it's business or personal. And so um, fast forward to, I undergrad. And at that point, uh, I was not only writing, but, uh, you know, I was sort of inspired by some of the early punk bands who said, you know, just do it, just DIY, just pick it up. And so I started my first band, uh, freshman year of undergrad, a horrible band, Building B. We wound up playing a one frat show at a college in uh, the middle of Georgia. 
Yeah, you know, th that was the bug because then I really got to combine all elements. You know, I was writing all this original music. We were only playing original music. I never played in a covers band. I never wanted to play anybody else's music when I had all this stuff bursting out of me. And so, you know, um, once I realized, wow, you can perform, you can create, you know, so it satisfied so many things. And I felt like I was making a contribution and it gave me an escape from school, you know, because I was, uh, I was the president of SGA undergrad, you know, I was really involved academically, you know, make, like most of us that got into vet school, you know, we had to make really good grades. So it gave me this escape. Right. And I think that was really fulfilling and it just kept growing from there. And I did, briefly stopped performing and writing in, in bands uh, my junior year of vet school, I'm sorry, of undergrad. And that was kind of my last year. I was buckling down and uh, I just couldn't, I just didn't have the time. And so um, I was still writing, you know, and doing some prose and things and doing some poetry readings at uh, in Georgia at 40 Watt and so forth. But, uh, you know, I wasn't performing music. And then what happened, I got into vet school early after three years. And uh, and I was really proud of that, that I was paying for all my college education. I mean, my parents couldn't afford to, to send me to college. So I was on my own and my wife was the same situation. So saving a year of tuition was a very big deal for me at that time. And anyway, I, I I get into vet school and I'm not in a band and I'm just a gunner. Right. And so now the first, you know, four or five months of vet school, I'm like, you know, crushing it. I, I, I remember making a B on the very first anatomy uh, exam, which put me in like the top five or 10 of the class, you know, and, and I remember Dr. Purintin was like, good, good going guy and all that kind of stuff. And I was just empty. You know, I was just so burnt out. And my wife at the time, my, my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, um, was off at University of Tennessee and she was on a, on a college music scholarship. Interestingly, she plays clarinet, beautiful clarinetist, um, uh, really phenomenal talent uh, and an artist, uh, just really talented person. But regardless, you know, I'm on the phone going, I hate this, you know, I mean, I, I'm not. And she literally said, you, you, you got to get in a band. And, you know, that was so contrary to the environment around me, which was just put your head down, keep studying, double down even more, right? You're doing great. And I was like, this is not worth it. I mean, I'm literally hollowing out the soul of the person that I am. And I, I didn't feel like I was growing at all. I felt like I was actually retreating into this person I didn't know and didn't want to know. Um, and so um, literally there was an ad in the red and black and as serendipitous as this sounds, um, there was an ad in the red and black, which was our college newspaper. And uh, I mean, that day, so Laura's like, you know, you, you, you're, you're killing yourself, right? You know, you, you've got to get that back. And uh, she probably didn't like who I was becoming either, you know, because I was a bit of a of a cold rag, I guess, the wet, wet rag. And so anyway, uh, there's an ad and I answer it. And lo and behold, it is a guy from my hometown of Albany, Georgia. Now, I remember I had already started all these bands back in Albany. And we were the only band playing original music. And not that it was good, but we were the only band brave enough not to play you know, Bon Jovi. We were like, I'm going to play punk rock. And so this guy was like, oh my gosh, you're Ernie Ward. You did that, those bands back there. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And uh, he goes, yeah, come on down. You know, we're putting together a band. And so it was like instant connection. And so um, later that, a uh, couple of weeks later, we added the final piece of that four piece, Jimmy Guthrie, uh, and who we've remained lifelong, very close uh, to this day. Uh, he's still does music in Atlanta. And so that was how the Violets was born freshman year. Our very first gig was um, at Christmas break for vet school. And we had a, a, um, a party at one of uh, my classmates house. And that was the, that was it. And then the next show we played was opening for widespread panic. And back then panic was, you know, not just like us, a local band. Uh, and, you know, got to, you know, just it was it was cool being in that scene. So that that was that was how it is. That's a long story. But it was a it was a really great time to be a musician in Athens, Georgia. You know, this is the 80s. And so we would just seen, you know, the crest of REM, right? So now this is 88. Uh, when when the violets started up. And so REM was, you know, this massive machine. And, and we got to know all those guys, you know, personally. And uh, it was just a cool, cool scene. All the B-52s were down there. Pylon was down there. I mean, you know, all the great squalls. I mean, you know, a lot of cool music. Mitch Easter was down all over the place. I mean, it was, it was a cool scene. Very cool. So just out of curiosity, I, I really like names. So where did you come up with the violets? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. One we've been asked many times. We have no clue. Uh, the story <laughs> on that was we we had our first big gig opening for Widespread, and so we had no band name, right? Uh, well, actually, we had booked the Widespread gig, and we wanted to play at Craig's house, my vet school, uh, Craig Roberts, who's an equine uh, surgical specialist now. Uh, and so we had booked that, and so we were like, we got to have a name, right? And so we decided on a Friday night we weren't leaving our practice space, which was literally just a storage shed, a concrete wall storage shed. Um, and we said, we're not leaving until we get a name. And so um, all I can recollect from that night, <laughs> because there were a lot of, uh, you know, it took a long time, we had a big, massive whiteboard. And apparently, some people in our band claimed that we had about 50 or 60 names. I have no idea. All I know is the next day we all rolled in and Royce, the drummer who was from my hometown in Albany, Georgia, said, all right, guys, what do you, you like the name? And, and we were like, what? What's the name? <laughs> None of us knew or could remember. It was the Violets. And that was that. We just didn't question it. We just went with it. None of us, none of us know exactly how it happened. Uh, a lot of rumors. Apparently, one of Royce's girlfriends suggested it that night. And then apparently we thought it was the violence. I, I don't know. There's who knows. <laughs> <laughs> you just rolled with it and it made it work. I love that. Well, so this is this is really interesting because this is a very common theme that is discussed in veterinary medicine is is burnout and I think we do realize that it it, it happens very young in our careers as well. So when you were experiencing this, did you notice other people in your class that was kind of experiencing this or you know, were you able to kind of help people understand that Fulfilling this creative, I think, yeah. urge helps. Megan, it's a great point. And, you know, it's one I've, I've written a lot about. And I think that what I would say is uh, we normalize burnout early, right? So, so, and I think that's the danger is that we say this is this is accepted part of being a veterinarian. So even at school, you know, I mean, I'm having Delmar Finco and, and PT, you know, Dr. Purinson and all these great, you know, professors, um, and, and they're just saying, overwhelming amount of work. And if your life strays outside of these four walls of the university, you know, you're wasting your life. And, 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 and so I don't think that's healthy at all. So um, I, I think that um, we normalize it early, we experience it, and then and people break into it. Uh, you know, I would say the vast majority of my class did experience lots of, of burnout and stress. Um, at the time, what was what was really tragic about going to the University of Georgia in the 80s is we were one of two schools that was notorious for failing you out. And so Cornell and Georgia, and honestly, half of my professors had come down from Cornell. There's a lot of history there that we won't get into today. But basically, the, the culture of those two schools was if you failed a test or I'm sorry, a class, then you were out. And we even had classes where 100% of your grade was on one test, one final exam. And in fact, there were several lawsuits uh, that came out of our class because, you know, people were bouncing out after one test. And, and, um, and they didn't put you back, you know, like now they actually will say go to the next year or come back or whatever. Back then it was just your career you know, it was over. So it was really stressful. And again, you know, I think that there are healthy ways to deal with stress. And for me, I definitely needed that creative outlet. That was just who I was. And I don't think that you have to, to do music, but I do think you need to find some escape mechanism. If you don't have a, a vent that you can actually safely and healthily, you know, go to and, and let it out, then and you're, you're going to wind up bottling it up and eventually you explode. And so, you know, I, I do encourage people to pursue creative endeavors simply because I think it taps into a different part of your brain and psychology and arguably your physiology. But regardless, you know, I think that those, the skills, I, and I've said this so many times in lectures over the years, the skills I learned managing bands, writing music, booking ourselves out, dealing with coked out, you know, club managers who didn't want to stiff you on the guarantee and, and dealing with with, you know, just cr some really crazy situations. Those prepared me for life in ways I couldn't have gotten just within the confines of vet school. So whatever you want to do, whether it's macrame or art or writing or, or you know, chess, I don't know, whatever it is, you need to have some outlet, I think, to be a whole and complete person. Well, and I personally, I find that in podcasting as well. I, a lot of the same things that you're mentioning, I'm able to have this creative outlet with the podcast. And, and so it, this could be a theme throughout your career as well, because you do so many creative 
endeavors like writing and you've done that for so long. So just kind of going back a little bit of a timeline. So after vet school, did you did you change throughout vet school on what you thought you might do as a veterinarian or? No, set? not at all, Megan. <laughs> you, you know, I was pretty resolute. I was going to be a practice owner from day one, which is why we started what later morphed into the VBMA or the Veterinary Business Management Association. So at vet school, um, my sophomore year, I realized, man, we are not talking about any of these management skills, communication skills, stress coping mechanism, nothing, nothing was, you know, come on, it was just didactics. And so I started what we called at the time, the success club, the veterinary success club. And so it was a group of, I mean, we had about, you know, good, 12 to 15 that would show up every month. And I had a mentor, Dr. Bob Lewis, who really encouraged us and bought us pizza. So again, uh, he was a wonderful, you know, inspiration for us. And we brought in speakers from all different facets of the university, you know, whether it was a lot of business speakers, right? Because we had the, the business school there and we had journalism school, we had all these schools. And I was just like, can we call? And the professor would say, no, but I got a TA, right? And so they'd send their TAs out, which was just as good for us because we never had anybody teach us, you know, these skills or, the, or learn these concepts. I would say that um, getting back to your, your question about, you know, okay, um, the timeline, I knew I was going to be a, an owner. And literally, you know, as soon as I graduated, I worked the only job I ever had until just recently, uh, I worked for 14 months, you know, and then I started my first clinic when I was 26. Oh, wow. So from there, did you how did you start to get into a lot of these different endeavors? Did you did you start as heads down, I'm going to do this clinic or at the same time, were you starting, were you continuing your creative? Yeah, outlet? great, great question. It gets a little interesting here. So basically, uh, it was heads down, how do we make a successful business? And I had an entrepreneurial spirit. And so 1994, and then 1995, 1994, I developed something called Telepet. Uh, we actually sold this. And so uh, back then, you got to realize you didn't have computer modems, there was no real internet, there was no browsers. This is probably or right around the time when maybe, I don't even think Netscape had come out at that point, because that's a little later, I think around 98. But regardless, um, so you would buy a computer and it didn't have a modem. There was no way to connect your computer to the internet. There was no Wi-Fi or any of that stuff. And so what I stumbled upon, because I was always a very tech guy, and I was also into music production, was that a lot of people were beginning to put these things called modems into computers, right? So we had AOL and all that stuff that was just beginning to, to really grow at this time. This is early 90s, really 94. And I also was frustrated with, I was doing emergency call, I'm in rural North Carolina. And so, you know, the pager's going off at all hours, and I'm answering questions like, you know, what are these spaghetti looking things coming out of my dog, you know, and all this stuff, right? And so, um, which is roundworms, obviously, <laughs> uh, but people don't know that, and they're panicking and it's 2 a.m. and they want an answer. And so I developed this system called Telepet. And basically what it did was it replaced our paging system and you would call in and I created all of these scripts, which later became the LifeLearn client education handout. So like, it's funny, you know, how you repurpose, like if you build something early that's innovative, how you can morph it and continue to evolve it. And so basically, you know, we created a, a couple of hundred different templates and uh, eventually, and basically you would call in and say, you know, if you have an emergency, you could actually click press one if you're a client, if you're not a client, and it would eventually page me. But the beautiful thing about the system that people didn't understand was the old pagers, you just type, put it in your number. So it's alphanumeric only, right? But this allowed people to leave a message. I would then call back to the computer at the office, the modem, and get a message. So people don't realize how unsophisticated paging really was back in the day. Uh, and even then, if you paid a, a, a service, all they would do is give you the same message. So I was like, I don't want to save, I don't want to save money. But but regardless, we wound up uh, developing what's called uh, a client education portal. So basically it said, if you have a question, you know, about uh, vomiting or diarrhea, so we like listed the top 25 and people could press and hear a recording, a short recording that we had made with my music production skills and put them now in a computer modem. And then, of course, we also had a fax back. So if you didn't want to listen to the two or three minute discussion on roundworms, you could then press another button back in the days of faxes when on literally lots so many people had faxes, but that would fax back these little client education handouts. So that was, you know, again, when people say, you know, you've always built businesses and tried different things, and most of them fail, including Telepet, um, because vets were scared to death to put a modem in their computer. You know, I remember like we would sell these and vets would be like, where do I put it? It's like, well, first you're going to take the cover off. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not touching that computer. It'll blow up. But regardless, you know, I've always 
try to improve efficiencies in my life, you know, reduce workflows and friction points. And this was one of those areas. So that, you know, Telepet was just one of a long line of things that we did. But, you know, it was, it was really, as you mentioned, a, a desperate attempt to survive as a solo practitioner in rural North Carolina. Oh, fascinating. Okay. So your head's down, figuring out how business is going to work in the veterinary space. Sounds like you're, you're being uh, innovative in, in that process, but where was there a moment where you realized that you needed like other creative outlets? Was there a moment or did it just kind of naturally as you're trying to solve problems, they kind of came about? Yeah, I think I think it's more the latter, the organic, you know, and so now I'm not doing music, you know, I'm a vet, but I'm writing constantly. I mean, I'm writing hundreds and hundreds of documents a year, you know, and we're, because this stuff didn't exist. I mean, you know, even the exam report cards like that was something that we dreamed up, you know, and uh, um, so, so there's a lot of stuff that's happening because, again, this is in the early 1990s. I, you know, it's, this is from 92 to really I'd say 92 to 98 is when like a lot of the transformed the things that we were doing. And that's and, and that's what kind of led me up, you know, to to where it started breaking out into speaking and writing. So, you know, I, I didn't write a single article. I didn't do a lecture or anything until I had owned my clinic for eight years. And, and I and I really I had no desire. I was so busy and we were growing like and we were doing some really cool things. But it wasn't until um, Hills wound up getting a report that we were selling the most dog food of any clinic in North Carolina. And th these people, these big wigs, wherever in Kansas, are like, w where is this guy Calabash? And literally, I'm pretty sure they thought we were somehow diverting sales. Like so we were doing something illegal. It was like, we never even heard of this place. It's one person. And, you know, and so um, they started coming down. And then the Pfizer folks, same thing, you know, we're like selling tremendous amount of stuff. And they wound up inviting me out to this um to this meeting, these corporate meetings. And so I, I guess the big one was Hills. And literally, so now I'm eight years in. So this is now around 99 ish, 90, yeah, 98, 99, probably from that in that time frame. And so basically, you know, uh, people are starting to say, wow, would you share some of this stuff? And Wendy Myers was the editor for Veterinary Economics, which was really a seminal publication back in the day. I mean, that was the go to. And it was a really cool environment, Megan, because our sister publication was Medical Economics. So we were owned by the same publisher. And so we got to learn and cross pollinate with, you know, people that were entrepreneurs on the human medical side independent practitioners. It was fascinating time. You know, I mean, Fritz and I talk, I mean, Fritz Wood and I and Marty Becker, you know, Don Dooley, all those guys, like we were, it was really interesting to be able to have that, that interface. Uh, but regardless, uh, Wendy Myers comes up to me and she was like, you know, Dr. Ward, I'm, I'm just hearing all these things about your clinic and you're doing things differently and you got all these systems and, and blah, 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 and staff training. Uh, would you be interested in writing for us an article? And, you know, I was kind of like, I'm so busy or whatever. And I literally just kind of punted on it. <laughs> like, I don't have time to deal with this. And, you know, it just didn't, I didn't, you know, feel like I had anything to say. And she kept, she was persistent. I'll give her that. And, uh, you know, later that was, you know, that was how I got introduced. And, you know, I started writing for them and we had great response and then you know later later became a board member and all that so you were the only veterinarian in this practice busy 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 you're doing well um as a business owner i am curious did you did you feel lonely was there what kind of kept sparking your interest in veterinary medicine that kept you going well, nothing's kept spark. I mean, the the fire was blazing at this yeah. point. I mean, you know, so, so once I'm owning my own business, I'm running it and developing all these systems, you know, the, I was never waning in enthusiasm, right? Because I mean, now it's like, you know, what can we do now? What can we do now? And I was really fortunate, you know, because after about three years, Laura, uh, my wife, who is a speech pathologist, was working at a hospital about an hour, hour and a half away. And so by that time, you know, I needed someone like a, a proper manager, right? You know, we didn't really have that. And so she uh, quit her job as a SLP and came on. And that was really a stroke of luck and genius because A, it was lucky that she has an incredible business acumen. So I had this built-in partner who we didn't know she had all these amazing skills, but she was great at organizing, at leading teams, at developing systems and really oversight. And and so the reason that, that our relationship really thrived in that environment was because we 
we were we would approach problems at two different with two different perspectives. So I was a top line growth person. So I was always like, what can we do more? Right? How can we do more? Right? And she was always like, how can we do it profitably and efficiently? And if you can kind of marry those two, because what it meant was I would come and brainstorm and give this idea, and then she would come back and and sort of you know distill it into, well, this is too expensive. We would it would never be profitable. And so it was really nice to have that check because without those checks, I would have probably wound up bankrupt early on. So it was nice to bring her in as like this counterweight balancing force or whatever. And, you know, and like I've said multiple times over the years, like um, two people working in the same business only has two outcomes. One, if they're synergistic and they get along, it's phenomenal. There's nothing like it to have someone who you know has always got your best interest at, at hand, right? I mean, you know, there's just no doubt. Or it ends in divorce. You know, and there's almost no in between. Uh, and I, and I and I don't say that lightly because I've seen so much. You know, I mean, I've been, you know, I'm 56 years old, and I, so I've seen a lot. And and there's almost no in between. Either it thrives and supports and nurtures to these levels that you alone can't do. Or, you know, so first and foremost, I got through all those times because I had my wife with me and we didn't have children until later in life. The second thing is that I talk about my first year of practice, I realized I needed a network, right? I needed some support and mentors and I wasn't going to get it because, you know, the nearest vet was nearly an hour away at the time. And so, uh, I mean, there was one closer, but uh, very competitive environment. So this person was not um, was not a, an ally for me, right? And that's okay too. I, I get it. But regardless, and we had bought. There's a, such a, a long story about. Uh, I had bought a clinic from a vet who had been arrested on animal abuse charges. So not only was there no blue sky, there's was dark clouds, thunder clouds. Because you know, in fact, really, the first uh, six months, people would uh, not only leave dirty notes on the door and break windows, but they would, they, they would always, they confuse me with the, the animal abuser guy because he did some really bad stuff. <laughs> Interesting note though, guys, uh, you know, people can just cross state lines and keep on practicing. We need to clean this up. That's a whole other issue. When people ask me why I'm so passionate about some of these sunshine laws, that's one of the reasons why. But regardless, I developed this, this network of local business owners that I really admired. And so there was a dentist who was very instrumental in my early career. Career, right. So a dentist was doing this. Of course, Dr. Bob Lewis from the University of Georgia, very instrumental, could call him up, you know. And then there was an HVAC guy. I mean, there's like all these little people that we started assembling around us, right? There was a great lawyer who became our family lawyer and our business lawyer. And, and I could could call them up with an issue or a concern. And even though they weren't veterinarians, it was actually better because I got a different perspective on, you know, wow, this is what it takes. So I would say to anybody who feels isolated ever, just reach out, just ask people, you know, I mean, like I, I and, and people ask me, you know, from time to time. And typically I, I do whatever I can to help them. But I would say that, you know, the most important thing you can get are people that will be a sounding board. Like, you know, they didn't, none of these people like did the work, but I would run ideas by them or express frustrations. And they would say, Hey man, you know, you're, it's okay. Let me tell you, I deal with the same kind of crap in my business. Right. And it was really nice to, to come back and center me. And I, I think that if I didn't have that early in my career, yeah, I probably would have experienced burnout, but I felt like every time that I felt that something was overwhelming, that I could reach out to this little group and say, man, golly Moses, this, this just happened. You know, am I off my rocker or what, you know, did, should I have done this? What? And these people would give me ideas. Oh, I, I love the, the getting outside of the veterinary medicine sometimes is really helpful to have different perspectives. And I think you find that there are more parallels than you ever would have imagined when you when you talk with people outside of vet med. So that's fantastic. So, OK, so you were doing well and it was definitely noticed among products because they could see the results from that. Is this where you started getting more people reaching out, asking you to do writing and video? And I mean, eventually you get to the Rachel Ray show, like all of those things. Was it a mix of networking and just kind of word of mouth? 
Yeah, and you, you got to realize, Megan, I mean, 30 years ago was a very different landscape. There's no internet, there's no social media. I mean, you know, so for people to find out about you, especially when you're in rural, I mean, we are in Brunswick County, North Carolina, you know, one of the poorest uh, counties in all of North Carolina. And so I um, love it. You know, I love the beach, but, you know, it's, it's we're remote. And so um, what, what really, I think what, what got me was, number one, um, you know, I did a couple of articles for veterinary economics that were very, very well received. And um, and they were really on some things, some concepts that people weren't doing. And so suddenly people are like, well, who is this? And if you know, and, and I remember a lot of people saying to me, well, if this guy in rural podunk America can do it, man, we can thrive in Chicago or in San, San, you know, San Francisco, wherever we are. Um, at that point, I had never done any speaking. And Dr. Bob Lewis invited me to speak at the University of Georgia like an alumni weekend. And so I had three hours. And I remember I was the only person there who was trying to use power PowerPoint, <laughs> because PowerPoint <laughs> was new. And um, and so everybody used 35 millimeter slides, which none of your younger audience has any clue what I'm talking about. And so basically you would carry when we talk about a deck, that's what we meant. Like you had to carry a, 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 a carousel of slides that you had had made. And so um, I remember showing up and I, I had my deck, uh, but I also had my computer and nobody knew how to hook it up. And luckily I sort of got my way into this projector. And it was literally one of those, if you remember the kind that your professors might have drawn on, right? Yes, yep. Right. So I've wound up manipulating, there was a, a weird VGA connector and it just so happened to work. It was not very good resolution. It was, I think it was 320 by 320, which is terrible resolution these days in high def world. And anyway, so A, from a technological perspective, I think the audience said, oh, wow, this is different, you know, because it looked different. It was projected differently. Right. And I was talking about different ideas. And so after that presentation and then these two articles in Vet Ec that year, it was just sort of off to the races. You know, I think that that um, if you have, you know, that that was a that was one of the few times in my life where I had good timing. I've always been a little bit too far ahead, but that was one time when when sort of there was this big shift in medicine, and you know, small animal medicine was now becoming the predominant mode in, in our in our industry, if you will. And so I was bringing these really fresh ideas. I mean, we were doing things that you know, especially around leveraging our staff and staff training, and you know, we were doing wellness plans. You know, this was in '96, right? And so you know, we had already. Started started all that, those templates for what would later become your wellness plans where people would pay a monthly install, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we were already doing that. I mean, we had home delivery. I mean, we, I bought an old used van and we have people delivering, you know, food <laughs> to people in medicine. So, you know, we were, we were doing stuff probably a little bit too far ahead. Uh, but, you know, these were fresh ideas and, and it was just kind of off to the races. I mean, the TV stuff, um, you know, I, I, I that was always, I think, you know, like most people that have had much success, you attribute 90% of it to luck, right? You know, and so I think that I had been uh, asked to do some local TV, uh, PetWise with Dr. Ward, and I had I wound up meeting a lifelong friend who was the uh, producer there at the local TV station, and he just thought I had something, and he just wound up, you know, sending tapes, and I mean, I, you know, just on my behalf, which actually that guy sent a tape to Animal Planet, and we were scheduled to do a pilot with me doing this thing called Vet Extreme. That was the pilot where I would go out and do that. Remember, this is this is in the, the 90s, you know. Uh, but later, I wound up uh, being on a show with Jeff Corwin called King of the Jungle. And so, um, you know, that was kind of, again, just serendipity, right? Like, I take no credit for it. I just, uh, you know, I, I do think that I at the back in the day, you know, I, you know, definitely had good, you know, I was good on TV. I was able to, to, I, I liked the live environment and, you know, it kind of became this thing where me and Marty Becker and Jeff Werber from LA, you know, were kind of, you know, kind of it. Um, and again, this is all pre social media. Yes. Well, and I think that's why it makes it even more of an interesting story is, you know, you were, as you, you described it, the, the middle of nowhere, <laughs> North Carolina, which I, I guess what, what brought you to that particular location in North Carolina to begin with? <laughs> it was cheap. The practice was cheap. Oh, okay. We later found out why. The people did not disclose all the information that the guy had been led away in handcuffs on TV uh, for animal abuse. I mean, and you could, that's a rich story, right? When the local small town vet is accused of doing some awful things, you know? 
Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we, we didn't quite. And, and again, you know, to my credit, yes, we could have like hired investigators, but you know, you're buying this clinic that had gone, you know, under and you, I mean, you know, and I, we were told the story of, you know, health issues and all this stuff. And it was like, yeah, I guess being locked up will cause some health issues, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. That's why I think it's even more interesting is yeah. because. Well, one, 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 there, there is a little bit of a, there's more to the story. And let me just quickly oh, tell you. Okay. So, so, and again, this is pre-internet and all this stuff. So my wife and I were in Asheville and, uh, you know, I'm working for my first job. She had done a year at Braintree. She had done a year of research up there. And so uh, at this point, we're, you know, now married and we're ready to launch our life. And the first thing we're going to do is buy a clinic. And, and we knew sort of what we wanted. But, you know, again, you're a young couple. You're just married. And, and I'll tell you, I credit to this day, there was this book. Uh, it was called Places Rated Almanac. And so you guys, again, there's no internet for questionnaires. You would have to go to a bookstore and buy these books. And basically it was a a whole book with a a bunch of detailed questions trying to determine the place that you would most likely be happy in, right? And like, you know, we're both from small town. We love the ocean, but we also like the beach. I mean, I like the mountains, but we like all these things. So we go through and we each independently take this this big, massive book of questionnaires, the places rated. And so it we kind of concluded and it gives you like you should live in coastal North Carolina and you should. And so we wound up the two options, believe it or not, were Seaside, Oregon and Calabash, North Carolina. And so, again, later to have Seaside Animal Care, there's always this double story behind that. Right. Because we literally we flew out to Seaside, Oregon. And um, because we're like, okay, these are the two places we're going to live. (laughs) So we went out there and we just didn't feel it. Right. And, and, you know, um, we, it was a long way from home. It was kind of cold. It just wasn't what we experienced. It wasn't our beachy vibe, right? We grew up in the South. We're, we're both from Georgia. Grew up on the Florida Panhandle, you know, seeing the beautiful, you know, crystal beaches there of, of Panama City and Destin. And so then we came and uh, my mentor, Dr. Bob Lewis, identified this clinic that, again, under kind of suspicious, you know, suspicious origins was for sale. And, you know, um, and Bob had put me on a couple of different clinics. But uh, when we came here, it was just like, got it. This is this is it. You know, this is this is where we're going to stay. And and that was, you know, uh, 92. And we've been there ever since been here ever since. Yes, I I happen to be quite partial to that area as well. So I I understand why you might have felt the magic to it. I I also feel it there as well. So um, one of the other things that, you know, reading, yeah, stalking you, as you described it, uh, <laughs> I saw that a lot of your your beliefs and vision is around like life enhancement. And you had a, a really fascinating quote talking about, you know, veterinary medicine is not limited to simply diagnosing and treating disease. So did you always have that philosophy? Did Was there some incidents or, or times when that started to really grow and develop and, and start to be more of a kind of like a life mission for you? Hi, we'll be back with the second half of the show after this quick break. But first, I wanted to take a moment and thank you for listening to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. If you're enjoying the show, the best way to support us is to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us to reach more listeners, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Yeah, I, I think it was. I mean, I think that that was kind of hardwired into my DNA. Like I, I um, was always a very sensitive uh, child, uh, very, very sensitive. And I'd grown up in this very rural environment. All of my family, uh, other than my immediate family, farmed and still farms to this day. And so, you know, I kind of grown up, you know, uh, very close to all of that world. And so, uh, A, you know, there was never any I mean, I, <laughs> this was what I was going to be from when I was very little. And there's some tragic origins to that, you know, but, but regardless, you know, um, I think that I've always realized that being a veterinarian was more than just, you know, the 
the diagnosing and prescribing end of it. And it was really to support the entire family unit. And, and I think that, um, you know, looking at it from a holistic perspective really changed the way I, I, you know, because I had a high emphasis on client communication and how I bonded with clients because I realized that, you know, they weren't just paying the bill, but they were actually part of the health ecosystem of that animal. And so, you know, I think that if you try to separate these out and break them out and distill them, you know, and reduce it down, then you miss the bigger picture. And so, you know, for me, when I say life enhancement, obviously, I think that pets are additive to our quality of life. I think that healthy relationships, you know, I think that exercise and nutrition, I mean, you know, all those things, it's really about how, I mean, this is what you got. How do you make the most of it? And so, you know, and I've, I've been lucky in this journey to have a lot of friends, Stephen Kotler, you know, who's done all the work with Flow, uh, you know, who writes all the big best-selling books, you know, on abundance and bold and all that stuff. You know, you kind of intersect with these other people throughout your life and you realize, wow, we're all kind of seeing it from the same lens, right? We're different, different uh, focus, right? So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at flow research, you know, or psychological states of, of optimization, but I'm looking for, you know, how do we enhance the human animal bond and how do we create a family environment um, that is, is conducive, you know, for, for supporting that. So for me, it's always been about, okay, I love animals. I want to make sure that they are healthy and happy, but I also realize that part of making an animal healthy and happy is to have a healthy and ha happy human counterpoint. And so that's really, I think, where it all intersected. And then, you know, what, what happened to me um, during my life journey so far, uh, my wife and I wound up, you know, really going into a deep dive in genetics because she is adopted and we were able to only find out that her birth mother was also adopted. So black hole from medical information. And so then when we're trying to, you know, now we're uh, in our early thirties and we're thinking about having a family, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and all I knew from my family was that all of the men died of cardiovascular disease, which is why, you know, I became plant-based as soon as I left home. <laughs> you know, so as soon as I got to college, I'm like, I'm not eating, I'm whatever those guys were doing, I'm not because they'd all died. Uh, and my father, you know, had, had open heart surgery and yada, yada. And so, you know, I was like, I'm going to do the opposite direction. But anyway, long story short, we started really looking at genetics and longevity principles and so forth. And that's really kind of what led led me into, you know, what what would really become a lifestyle of, you know, endurance athletics and just, you know, real discipline as far as, you know, how we live our lives. And, and you know, and, and we're big, both my wife and I are really into, you know, tracking every metric we can with our life, you know, whether it's heart rate and blood pressure and sleep quality and all that. I mean, we're constantly evaluating that. Um, and again, I think that's just a curious, right? You know, we're scientifically minded people. But um, it, I, the one thing I would say to people of your age, you know, so now if you're in that, you know, early 30s, late 20s type category, is that you should do this soon. I think that that what what I got lucky was the fact that I had already started changing my diet, you know, 18, 19 years of age. So I was already like healthier from a nutritional standpoint, although I was a junk food, you know, vegan, as we say, junk food vegetarian, <laughs> because, you know, you're still, you know, you're, you're living off just carbs, right? But regardless, um, what it led me to is to say, okay, I, in my 20s, I made decisions, I created habits that have gotten me to 56. And, you know, I, you know, I mean, I'm as strong physically. Uh, I mean, I'm almost, I mean, my bench and squats are very similar to what they were in the thirties. Um, obviously endurance is down. Um, that is the one thing I don't have my hair. I mean, so there are some changes with aging, but you know, I'm looking at my counterparts who are 56, almost 57. And you're kind of realizing, wow, the decisions that I made in my late 20s, early 30s are what are actually propelling me into my 50s, 60s and beyond. And I think that if there's one bit of advice now, it's to make these changes as early as possible. It's never too late to change, but the real benefits come, you know, looking back like 30 years ago and going, wow, the things I did in my 30 years ago are really paying off today. Yeah. Those are definitely things not worth putting off till later. <laughs> right. Just do it now. Um, and did that start to come into your career as well because you you've done a lot with pet nutrition yeah. and and so how did that potentially kind of come into your work 
Without a doubt. So I got in my early 30s, I got heavy into ultra endurance, specifically Ironman training. And so, you know, now I'm getting into this area where, wow, science fails us. I mean, nobody really does studies on, you know, what does it take to, to fuel your body for 12 to 17 hours, you know, of, of intense efforts? And, and how do you train, you know, five, six days a week at these levels and, you know, for years on end? And so, you know, there's a lot of pseudoscience. And so I started, you know, getting accreditations. I got my certified personal trainer in 05, 06. I got my USA uh, triathlon accreditation for coaching. You know, so I'm, I'm like pursuing all this stuff, right? And did a couple of, you know, little wonky nutrition things. Um, but I'm tr it's just to try to figure out what's going on in my body. How can I better enhance, you know? And again, I don't live in a big city where I can just call up a coach or go to a session. You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere, so I'm on my own. So all of that, you know, and, and what happened was uh, in 2005, you know, as I'm kind of now, you know, I'm starting to 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 really hit my stride with endur ultra endurance stuff. Um, and I wound up making the world championships to the half Ironman in 06. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of now like peaking almost physically as far as those those events. And so I remember talking to Steve Budsberg because I'm a speaker and Steve Budsberg is the past president of ACVS, who is also a professor of mine at University of Georgia. And we were at a dinner and I was complaining about obesity rates and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, you know, he challenged me. He's like, if you're, he goes, I'm sick of you always talking about fat dogs and cats. If you want to do something about it, why don't you do something about it? And that was actually how pet, pet obesity prevention uh, started in 05 from a challenge from Steve Budsberg. And, and later he became very supportive. I mean, he was one of our very first board members, probably was the first board member. Joe Barges was also right there. Uh, you know, Liz Lund. I mean, it was a great group back in the day. But regardless, um, and we have an even better group today, but um, all of this stuff is just combining. So now I'm learning all this knowledge and experience from human physiology, nutrition, and I'm looking at my pet patients realizing nobody's advocating for them. Like nobody's even speaking up. And literally at this time, aside from a couple of little casual remarks, it's kind of fat cats or happy cats. No, nobody's talking about the burgeoning waistline of labs, right? And so, you know, I that's what we started and it just led down this whole other thing. But it's interesting because people always are, I think people... You can come any way you want, but it's a pursuit of quality of life and longevity that leads you to obesity. So basically all of this life enhancement is like, okay, what is actually robbing the pets of quality of life in years? Well, the biggest factor is obesity. So that, that was literally why I chose that. Now, later I would found this thing called Project 25, which is to extend the life expectancy of dogs and cats 25% by the year 2025. We're not going to make it. That, that was started in 2015 believe it or not. But regardless, um, it's all about longevity and quality of life. And so obesity is the easy one. And if you can improve that, you just change and transform the lives of millions and millions. Yeah. And, and speaking of, I know that you're, you've been really active in this organization around obesity and you, you've got some fun things that you're, you're doing. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about the organization and some of the things that are, you're most excited about? Yeah, thanks, Megan, for asking. So, so basically, in 05, when when I founded the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, I I, I, I said broadly that there were going to be three stages that we would go through. And at the time, I kind of loosely said these will be 15 year increments. And you also have to realize that you know when you're dealing with life and big projects, don't be afraid to put long timelines. And I, I, there are certain times when obviously you know, it's like you know I want you to have six month goals and one year goals, but don't be afraid to say what you could accomplish over the next 10 or 15 years if you just grind it out. So so that was my ambition was I thought each of these stages, these three stages take about 15 years each. It actually took a little longer, but COVID definitely derailed part of that. So basically, the first 15 years I felt like of stage one was to raise awareness of pet obesity. Because again, if you rewind the tape to 2005, Megan, you know, people aren't talking about pet obesity. Not like today. I mean, you know, there, there were no tracks devoted to obesity. I mean, there was no lectures devoted to obesity. None of that existed. I mean, go back, check the record. This didn't exist. So we worked really hard to raise awareness. We did the prevalence surveys. You know, I, I was constantly, I mean, I wrote a couple of books at the time. I mean, I've since written about three books on, on nutrition and, and all that stuff. But anyway, so, you know, that's awareness. The second stage, which we just announced we're entering into 18 years later, <laughs> so, but COVID did definitely change it, is to encourage treatment. So the first phase was awareness, and then we have to get treatment. Because Megan, 
you're a veterinarian. I'm a veterinarian. The only treatment that we have in the United States to treat pet obesity is feed less, exercise more. Can you name something else? Well, I'm a nutritionist, so it's a hot topic for me. We'll be here for a while, but that is pretty much what most people will do. Yes. <laughs> right. Do we have an FDA approved medication? Nope. nope. Do we have a surgical intervention then? Nope. <laughs> no, no we, we have nothing else, right? And everything else is a hodgepodge of, you know, either supplementation or, I mean, you know, I mean, and, and even there really aren't any, there, that's it. It's feed less, exercise more. And so the, to raise awareness was part of it, but we got to get to treatments. And so we've completely, you know, we've changed, we've added a bunch of new people to the board and that might be something you want to get involved with later. <laughs> um, but um, regardless, you know, we are now moving into encouraging interventions because we don't have anything, right? We have great therapeutic diets, but A, they're poorly utilized uh, and and B, that's it, you know? So, and, and, and even when it comes to caloric expenditure of exercises, I wrote in 2010 in Chowhounds, I mean, come on, it is it is a guess, you know, and, and we still haven't evolved with our, any kind of tracking device that's worth a flip, you know, I mean, so we're still, you know, we're still in the infancy of all this stuff. And then of course, the third phase, which will be in about 15 years from now, is actually getting to the prevention. And people are always like, well, oh, that should have been your first thing. You can't prevent something unless you can, number one, recognize it, and number two, do something about it. So prevention is actually a really aspirational goal. In fact, you know, having worked with human obesity organizations, you know, quite closely over the last, you know, 18 years, uh, let me tell you that many of them are like, gosh, prevention is nearly, you know, wow, we are not even close. They're, they're, they are literally now, where we are in the human obesity is at the treatment phase. Okay, so they're ahead of us, but they're not they're not preventing. Okay, so they're just now. In fact, we've just seen an entire generation, a new classification of drugs. They're going to be just essential in treating obesity. But you know, we're not there. So um, we're not at prevention. So it's fascinating to look at this. But again, you know, do I think in my lifetime we will get to a point where we'll have FDA approved drugs? Yes. Do I think that surgical interventions? Maybe. There's already been a couple of, of studies, as I'm sure you're aware of. You know, there's a great, an interesting study that was done uh, with the particular type of sleeve, uh, uh, you know, gastric sleeve uh, procedure to, to, to treat obesity. Um, again, a lot of ethical issues I have around that. But regardless, you know, do I think this will happen over the next 15 years? Absolutely. Uh, and then maybe before, you know, I do check out, we'll be at the stage where we're actually seeing the numbers come down. Yeah. Well, and, and treatment gets it, it, there are complications, like you mentioned already, with the sleeve. Um, people have tried medications. I, I actually happen to know a little bit about that, but we'll have a two-hour yeah. conversation if we get too deep. So, <laughs> but no, it, it is really interesting. So I, I'm excited that we are starting to move into that stage. And I think you're right; we're probably not that far behind even in human health <laughs> when it comes to that. So, because I, I think there is a human element to the problem. So right. yeah, it gets really complicated, but it, it's fun. And I'm, I'm glad that gives you that <laughs> challenge in your career. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Megan, it was interesting because if, if you go back and like, I remember doing a lot of media appearances, especially around 2010 when Chow Hounds came out and, and, and literally it was a joke, like in the studio. I mean, like all the, the hosts and, and, you know, everything, I mean, they're all joking about it, you know, oh yeah, you know, this is so silly, you know, we got more important things to worry about, you know, but, but, uh, you know, come on, it's this little, little story that they had to talk about, right, you know, and this book was making some waves out there. Um, anyway, uh, if you fast forward to today, that sentiment is different. Like now, when you walk into that studio, they're saying, this is a real health threat, right? <laughs> these, these, these hosts get very serious. You know, it's just like talking about a human obesity epidemic. I mean, they're going, you know, what can we do? You know, what's, what really is happening here? You know, so what are some of the, like, it's a very serious conversation. I'm so glad to see that shift because again, you know, that's in the space of, you know, 12, 13 years where we've really gone from kind of this cutesy, funny, haha, <laughs> fat cats, happy cats to this now, oh my gosh, my, I had a cat who we had to, euthanize, you know, or I had a dog who couldn't get in the car anymore. I mean, suddenly now these hosts feel it and they there's, you know, it's, it's a impactful conversation. Yeah. And, and I think you're right that it needed that long of an awareness phase before people really shifted to the tone of the conversation. So now we really can be serious about treatment. So very exciting. I will definitely put links in the description towards the association if people want to learn more. You've got a lot of really fascinating uh, data and surveys that you've done looking at even 
pet owner thoughts around pet food. Yeah. I was looking through those. So a lot of and, great. And the new, uh, the 2022 U.S. State of Pet Obesity Report comes out mm-hmm. in just the next uh, couple of weeks. And so, um, you know, we, we've, the board has approved. All the data has been, you know, re- reviewed and, uh, you know, checked and triple checked. And so uh, that report is coming out now. And, and uh, you know, we're yeah, it's, it's a big transitional time for the organization. I mean, this was something that, you know, a long time in the making, but, you know, now we're working with a lot of industry, you know, so this is something that we felt like during the awareness phase, we really had to be completely neutral and independent, but for treatment, we have to collaborate. So now you're seeing a shift in sort of how we're functioning. And so, uh, but again, I will say to you guys, if you're watching and you have these kind of things, think big, think long, right? Because life is long. Like that is the one thing that people don't always give you enough credit for. And I think that, that, you know, I was Gen X and we were slackers, so we were never in a hurry to do anything. But, you know, I, I do see, especially I, I learned this from the boomers. I learned what not to do. And I see it some in the millennials, you know, this urgency, this constant, you know, like YOLO now, now. And it's like, I really would sit back and go, you know, if you if you're lucky and you do things right, you have a long life ahead of you. So, you know, there's no reason why, you know, I remember, you know, to that end, I, I remember one of the, the presentations that, that I gave to the Veterinary Success Club early, and this is probably, you know, like 91. And so I was, I guess, probably around the junior year. And I remember saying, you know, I, I see life and career in like 20 year segments. And so, you know, I was focused always on goal planning and still am. And I said, you know, what I think we should probably look at from a veterinary perspective is, you know, what what could we do if we were to chunk things out in 20 year gaps, right? So we do something for 20 years and maybe do nothing. So I said, I think you got like three of those in you if, if you do it right, you know, and, and you're lucky, of course, and so forth. The truck doesn't hit you. And I remember that was when I realized I was thinking differently than a lot of people around me because they they there were two two barriers to, to that kind of long long term thinking. Number one, they just couldn't imagine anything longer than like five years. Like so it's like 20 years is like, you know, so far in the future that you might as well be flying a flying car, right? And so I remember thinking, number one, they can't think longitudinally like that. And number two, I think that there are a whole lot of people and there's nothing wrong with this. It's like, they're just going to be happy and content just doing the one thing forever. I had a restless spirit. And I think that's part of my generation of Gen X of kind of watching boomers get completely, you know, abused and, and just kicked to the curb by big corporations. You know, here's the gold watch. Thanks for 30 years. Get out of here now. So, you know, I never trusted the system. I think that's just my generation. Um, And so hopefully it'll be better for future generations. Although I've got two Gen Z daughters and, I think they're more skeptical than me. But regardless, you know, trying to to look at your career and like, what if, what about 10 year or 20 year? You know, and, and so what we did uh, almost to the day was, you know, we owned clinics for 20 years and now we're in the next phase. Uh, I did uh, enter into politics unsuccessfully as a Democrat in rural North Carolina, not a recipe for success. Uh, and I did did quite frankly envision my next bucket to be more public service. Uh, and that didn't quite work out. I'm still doing a lot of public service, but uh, I went back into entrepreneurship after politics. But you know, what's wrong with kind of looking at your life in these big chunks and, and, and not being afraid to completely reinvent yourself, you know, and I think that uh, 10 year, 20 year hunks are good. Um, it takes some time and effort. But if you plan ahead, and I think Megan, that's where most people also kind of miss miss these opportunities, because they aren't planning planning ahead enough, right? So like, they don't ever give them those opportunities, right? So suddenly now they're 20 years in and they didn't develop alternative skills. And, you know, we used to talk about coinciding S curves of life. And you might've seen some of these in, in some of the, the self-help literature, but basically, you know, as you kind of go throughout any uh, skill set or job or career, you kind of go through these phases where you kind of go like this and you, you wound up plateauing. Okay. And at that point, you will then eventually decline and you don't ever want to try to get out of something on the decline because you're let little value. And so what you would try to do is have these curves intersect. And so 
before or right when you start to hit a plateau of something. So really, when I was around 12, 15 years into practice ownership, I really started doubling down, not only on civic outreach and you know public stuff, because I was thinking of this other thing, but also on additional entrepreneur and technological things. So that I was actually in a rapid development phase right whenever I started to plateau as a practice owner, at least in my opinion, right? And, and I knew that I had other metrics to guide me. And so what you try to do is do two or three of these curves throughout your life. And I hope that made some sense. It's better if you can see it written out. But but again, when you start to have mastery of some topic or domain, that's when you should be challenging yourself to look at something else and not completely like 180 degrees, but just maybe an adjacency that you can capitalize on that experience and then say, okay, this is going to actually boost my acceleration and I can actually do something different that's more additive. Because, you know, again, I, I just... I'm a restless spirit um, and not everybody should be because it does, but uh, it does make it difficult sometimes. But, you know, I would say a lot of very intelligent people are very curious people. And if you don't give yourself little off ramps to pursue other endeavors, then you might be frustrated. Yeah, I think that is so well said. I think, you know, in our early career, we've got things where we think we have everything planned out. And then it's that diving board of graduating vet school and we don't have anything planned often. So planning it far in advance, but also you said something really important too, is don't be afraid to, if that doesn't work, reinvent it. It's okay. Try something new. And I think that's it. Just the fear of, well, if I plan something and I don't do it, uh, then I'm a failure. And it's like, no, no, it's just being curious and, and being creative and trying things I think is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with you. It's, it's not really, you know, I, I've had a lot more misses than hits. And I think that sometimes when people see successful people and, you know, again, you want to bracket that, okay, financially successful. Okay. Check, you know, relationships. Okay. Check, you know, I mean, you know, quality of life, check, you know, fitness, whatever. So you see these people and you kind of go, oh, wow. But what they don't see is that that is built upon an entire mound of failed <laughs> endeavors, you know, I mean, for every hit that I have, I mean, like somebody was looking at me the other day, and it's a close friend of mine. And uh, this was a couple months back, and we're at dinner. And, and um, I, I had a really good year last year, a couple of businesses that I was involved with were acquired by very large uh, businesses. So it was like a great year. Um, and, and he was just joking. He was like, yeah, he goes, you know, somebody was telling me the other day about like how everything you do turns to gold. And he was like, he doesn't know you. <laughs> and we were both laughing because, you know, he was kind of recounting like during the same period, three other business endeavors that completely failed, you know, and lost money and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, but of course the world doesn't see that all the time. And I think that then it's sort of, how do you see yourself, right? So like, I don't see myself oh, because I failed here, failed here, failed here, I see myself as all those failures allowed me to win here, you know, because if I didn't, because I learned something from each one of those endeavors, uh, without a doubt. And so, you know, again, if you play this game right, you'll get to be my age where you're about to hit that sixth decade of life. And you feel like, oh, wow, you know, now I'm starting to get this. <laughs> you know? And, and I, I know I felt that way at 30. But I actually really do believe it now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I know we're out of time, so I'll just have one last question for you. Um, it's the very last question I, I always ask my guests, and that is, what is something that you are most grateful for? Oh, without a doubt, my family. I mean, you know, um, with, without meeting Laura, uh, love at first sight, uh, you know, this was freshman year of college. And so I'm actually doing a tutor session my best friend, Keith Kitchens, who's a dentist in Atlanta now, uh, we were both, uh, we were doing math tutoring. And so um, he knew this girl is, who was going to come meet him later. She played in the symphony with him, right? So he he was a, a violist and uh, she was a clarinet player. So anyway, we're doing our respective tutor sessions. And so my session is breaking and I'm waiting on my next student. So I walk out to go get some water and around a bookshelf, out of nowhere comes this, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life and squirting me with a water gun. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You're not who I thought you were. She thought she was squirting my friend, Keith. And uh, I was just like, 
that was it. Love at first sight. I uh, wound up, uh, we wound up after my tutor session, sitting on her car outside till they kicked us out of the parking lot at midnight. Uh, I went home, told my parents, I met the the woman I was going to marry. And of course, they're like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> You're an idiot. Uh, but that's what I'm most thankful for. Because without Laura, and then of course, you know, she's the mother to our beautiful daughters. I mean, you know, the, life just wouldn't be the same. So, uh, you know, I will say that you know, I've got this thing I'm working on uh, about the most important decisions that you make and how they impact your life. And, you know, I'm kind of getting to that stage of life where you go and you realize, wow, you know, there are some through lines here. And if you had chosen a different path, and that was one of the paths. And then the other part of that path is sticking it out, right? Because, you know, marriage is not easy. Raising a family is a challenge for anybody, no matter where, how, whatever. Uh, and so I think that, you know, sort of the fortitude and perseverance to stick with it, you know, um, I'm really, really grateful for that. So again, you know, if you want to, for me, the secret to a happy life is to surround yourself with love. And I, just got super lucky <laughs> and convinced this redhead to marry me. Uh, it took her eight years. Uh, you know, we had a very long courtship. We didn't want to get married in college to begin with, but, you know, it took a lot of convincing uh, to, for her. Um, she was way out of my league. But regardless, um, you know, that's the secret to happiness is to have that kind of love. Um, and then as you get older, you know, one, one of the things that people don't tell you about is being with being with this same person since 1986 she's been through all of this stuff with me. I mean, like there's this legacy and reservoir and archive that doesn't exist with any other person on the planet and never will, right? And so there's such value in having that archive with this person who's been with you from your first band to your last recording. You know, we did, we've been doing some off albums, you know, like a, a Clash tribute album and a, and a Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers, you know, so, so she's been there through all that and, and seeing us struggle in businesses right? And, and the challenges of raising children. And, and, you know, so I think that's, that's one of those hidden things to relationships people don't emphasize enough, but there is nothing better in life sometimes than being able to look at the person across from you and go, you know me better than anybody else. You've been through more than anybody else. And I'm here to the end. Like, that's just a, that's a satisfying, very, very satisfying part of life. That's beautiful. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, vet lifers.